Were there two brothers? I said there was only one brother. Ugh. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of True Crime. Wait, I said it wrong. Crew Crime. Crew Crime. Crew Crime. If you are new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you are in the right place. So make sure that you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. Look at this, I burned myself with a hot glue gun. It was really, really bad. Can you see? That's what's left after like a week. It was like the size of a jelly bean. I'm so proud of myself I didn't pop it. Yeah. So anyways, if you see this, that's what that is, it's a burn, burn myself. So today's terrible story takes us to the state with the longest life expectancy, 81 years. It's the home of the largest dormant volcano and the most active volcano in the world. It's also one of the only places in the world without snakes or squirrels or hamsters. It's also the very last state to join the union. This is Hawaii. What is this? Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the story of Eugene Barrett. Disclaimer, I don't normally talk about what products I'm using as I'm using them, you know, but if you're interested, just check down in the description box because everything that is available will be linked. So this story is actually gonna be a little bit shorter than what I've been doing recently. And I know you guys really love the longer videos, but I wanted to pop in with a little quickie this week. Also, <laughs> update on me. <laughs> I started to vlog Thanksgiving. You know, I wanted to show you guys the parade and all the shenanigans that I've been up to, but I got sick. So <laughs> the footage that I do have isn't really enough to stand alone, but I am hoping to pick it back up so that we can hang out this holiday season. You know, I think you guys like them, right? <laughs> anyway, so stay tuned. Let's get into it. Eugene Walter Barrett was born on June 30th, 19. 31 to Emily Medeiros Amorine and Howard Barrett in Oakland, California. Eugene was the oldest and he had a younger brother named Howard. So to be honest, I don't have a whole lot about Howard's, nope, his, not, his name is not Howard. <laughs> So there really wasn't a whole lot of information about Eugene's family life, his upbringing. It's kind of a mystery, to be honest. But I do know that a year after Eugene was born in California, the family moved to 319 Magellan Avenue in Honolulu, Hawaii. He attended the Washington Intermediate School until he dropped out in the ninth grade. He later enlisted in the United States Army and he even served in combat during the Korean War. In 19, it says 1995 in my notes. That's not right. <laughs> in 1955, the 24 year old Eugene was actually kicked out of the army for excessive drinking. That really seems to be like a common thread, doesn't it? Okay, so about a year after separating from the army in 1955, Eugene moved back to Hawaii. He worked sometimes, sometimes as a house painter, but was mostly unemployed. Eugene began a romantic relationship with a woman named Annie Phillips. She was a divorced mom raising five children by herself. You know, she was doing her best, but she and the kids were kind of sardined into a tiny apartment in Mayor Wright Homes, which is like a low income housing project near downtown Honolulu. Side note, the Mayor Wright Homes are still standing in Honolulu, but they are in bad shape now. But at the time, they were actually relatively new. Um, still small for that large of a family, but you know what I'm saying. Eugene was not only broke, unemployed, and alcoholic, he was an asshole. <laughs> Surprise. He was known to like fly off the handle. You know, he had an explosive personality and, you know, generally abusive. So after dating for a few years, Annie finally had enough of his shit and she broke things off in 1959. This would not stand, okay? Eugene could not handle that kind of rejection and he went high into the right. So shortly after the breakup, you know, Eugene was drunker than Cooter Brown and he armed himself with a gun, got on a bus, rode it across town to Annie's apartment. Then he walked up the stairs, went through the front door, walked right past the kids. Two of Annie's kids were in the living room watching TV and Annie was in the bedroom 
tending to the youngest child in his crib. Eugene went into the bedroom, pulled out the gun, shot her multiple times, killing her instantly. The neighbors were alarmed, you know, they heard the gunshots and they were able to actually catch Eugene and they held him down and beat the shit out of him until the police could arrive. The neighborhood witnesses actually told investigators that Eugene said that Annie deserved it. Well, the case went to trial. You know, the evidence against Eugene was pretty unbeatable, although Eugene tried to claim that he couldn't remember anything. You know, he was too drunk, so how could he be responsible? This shirt is so loud. <laughs> hear it? The lead prosecutor made an excellent case and Eugene was found guilty and he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Hooray! Well, not so fast. That life sentence was later commuted to 15 to 50 years. Well, then in 1967, Governor John Burns commuted the prison term to eight years. Why? We don't know. We don't know. But what we do know is that was a bad fucking idea. In February of 1971, Eugene Barrett was released from prison and returned to Honolulu, Hawaii. He met and pretty quickly married a woman named Roberta Aviero. And you know, as you might guess, this quickie marriage with an ex-con who killed his ex-girlfriend wasn't optimal. Also, Eugene's drinking problem resumed pretty much immediately after his prison release. So in November of 1972, Roberta filed for divorce. There actually was a child born of this marriage, but I don't think that they were together by the time that happened. Okay, so after the split, Roberta moved into the Hawaii Hotel on Cook Street in Honolulu, which I looked and it doesn't seem to be there anymore. I think it's like a, like a boarding house or something. Well, did Eugene handle this breakup any better than he did the last one? You know, the one that landed him in prison because he killed her. On December 27th, 1972, Eugene went to the Hawaii hotel and with a kitchen knife, stabbed Roberta several times until she died. After his arrest, he entered an agreement to plead guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. You heard me right, okay? And this is gonna be a recurring theme in the story. Repeat offender, woman murderer, got his charge reduced, reduced to manslaughter. And to be clear, the difference between, you know, murder and manslaughter, generally speaking, is premeditation. He went to her apartment that she moved into to get away from him with a kitchen knife and st that, that seems pretty pre-fucking-meditated to me. That sounds like merch, doesn't it? Pre-fucking-meditated. <laughs> anyway. Eugene was sentenced to 10 years in prison, of which he served four before he was paroled in 1976. Paroled, paroled. A man who had been in this exact same position and offended again, granted parole. After his release, he was on parole for seven years, but after that was completed, he was a free man. Hawaii, what are you doing? getting so upset, my little hairs are coming loose. Okay, so anyways, we skip ahead a few years and the now 64 year old Eugene, um, you know, who skated out of prison for the second time, he moved into an apartment complex on Kinau Street. This is like near downtown Honolulu. Am I saying that right? Kinau? Ki, ki, ki. I'm doing my best. By the way, that apartment was just blocks from where he had, you know, murdered Roberta by the way. It's said that Eugene was actually on his best behavior for most of the 80s and like early 90s. Of course, that couldn't last. He was definitely still drinking, definitely emotionally unstable. So that apartment on Canal Street was actually like a boarding house kind of, and one of his neighbors was 41-year-old Denisha Roxanne Kastner. She lived there in the apartment with her seven-year-old son, Ethan. Eugene and Roxanne did not have a relationship, although one of the news stories claims, or Eugene claims that they did hook up a couple times, but they were not romantic. What we do know for sure is that he was weirdly obsessed with her. He accused her of like mocking him by dating other men and indecently exposing herself in front of him. I imagine that she was like dressing for the weather. It's Hawaii. 
She was a single gal, but still technically married, although estranged from her husband, Jim Kastner. By this point, they had been separated for like three years. Although the news reports say that, you know, they were like best friends and they pretty much saw each other every day and they were co-parenting little Ethan. So Jim and Roxanne actually met in 1980 through mutual friends. They were pretty quickly married. Roxanne was a very magnetic person, you know, big personality. She had also overcome some serious things in her life. Like when she was 20, she was in a terrible car accident that left her paralyzed paralyzed from the waist down and she made a full recovery. Can you believe that? Roxanne and Jim's life revolved around their son, Ethan. Ethan was actually their second child. He was born in 1985, but about three years earlier, they had had a daughter. Her name was Alexis Kalani. She was born premature and she only lived for like an hour and a half. Roxanne struggled with substance abuse. She used pills and alcohol. Roxanne actually went through many rehab programs over the years, at least five, um, but she just, she couldn't get it together. She just kept slipping backward. But anyway, Roxanne's weird neighbor, Eugene, who she called Jean, made threats against her. And she definitely was aware of them, but, but she never thought that, that old guy would ever hurt her. Okay, so friends and neighbors would claim that Eugene would call them on the phone hysterically, saying that he was afraid he was gonna harm Roxanne. So these claims, these threats actually escalated to the point where Eugene voluntarily asked to be admitted for psychiatric treatment at the Queen's Medical Hospital, where he actually remained until August 1995. Did that hospital stay help? No. Well, during Eugene's hospitalization in the late summer of 1995, Roxanne had actually moved into another apartment down the street like across the street. You know, some unit had opened up and Roxanne gladly took it because she wanted to get some like physical space between herself, her son, and this weirdo Gene. Gene gets out of the mental hospital and he finds out that Roxanne moved and he was pissed. How dare she? That doesn't make any sense to me at all because he was so tortured by this woman. She removes herself from the situation and then he gets mad about it? The math ain't mathin'. On August 11th, 1995, Eugene and a friend spent most of the day drinking. While he was out on a beer run at a local store, he saw Roxanne and he watched her go into her new apartment down the street. What did Eugene do, you ask? He went to his apartment, grabbed his handgun, walked past seven-year-old Ethan, who was pushing his bicycle in the hallway, walked into her apartment, and shot her twice in the head. Ethan heard those gunshots and he went into his mother's room to find her barely clinging to life. Eugene had apparently scurried away unnoticed. Young Ethan called his dad, Jim, for help and Roxanne was taken to the hospital where she later died. Ironically, the hospital that she was taken to was the one where Eugene was treated. Great treatment. So the police officer that was the first to respond actually recognized Jean's name from a previous call less than a month earlier regarding an incident across the street. Jean had actually called 911, remember, because he was afraid that he was gonna hurt Roxanne. Well, an arrest warrant was issued for Eugene who was nowhere to be found, but the next day, Eugene entered the Columbia Inn, which is like a restaurant coffee shop on uh, Capiolani Boulevard. Capiolani Boulevard? <laughs> Eugene begged the manager to call the police so that he could surrender peacefully, which he did and he was. He was arrested and held in a detention center on $120,000 of bail or bond, whatever. Back at the crime scene, officer Lisa Reed found the murder weapon dumped in a wood fenced enclosure on South Veritania Street, a few blocks from the apartment. Um, the firearm, funny enough, was actually reported stolen back in 1989. Well, Eugene was charged with murder, theft, and unlawful possession of a firearm to which he pled not guilty because, you know, why wouldn't he? At least somebody has some damn sense because the chief of the Hawaii Paroling Authority later released a statement on the case and saying that this repeat offender, three-time murderer, would never earn parole with newer contemporary laws. 
Well, that's great. At the preliminary hearings, Roxanne's seven-year-old son, Ethan, was called to testify. At that time, he was actually the youngest witness to testify in court in Hawaii's state history. Ethan's uncle attended those hearings and he would sit in the gallery holding a big stuffed big bird while he listened to the testimony. Little Ethan was so small, he had to sit on a booster seat and he was barely able to see over the witness stand as he testified. He was asked asked if he was still friends with Eugene and Ethan said no and when he asked why he said because he killed Roxanne. Ethan was asked well how do you know Eugene killed Roxanne and he said well I've seen him walk out after the gunshots. Another neighbor Enrique Crisostomo also testified that he heard a scream and then two or three gunshots. When he opened the door to investigate the noise he found Ethan crying hysterically outside. Well, Eugene Barrett's bond or bail, whatever you want to call it, was eventually revoked. Good. And he was charged with second degree murder and three firearms offenses connected to the death of Roxanne Castor. Second degree murder? What second degree murder means is that although the action caused the death, that it wasn't premeditated. Although intentional, but meant to only harm, not to kill. Are you fucking serious? The guy has done this twice before. He went into her apartment with a firearm and shot her in the head twice. And this is after he said that he was having thoughts about harming her. How is that second degree murder? I'm not a lawyer, okay? I don't know things. Anyway, when the case eventually went to trial in early 1997, Eugene actually testified in his own defense. On February 19th, 1997, Eugene testified, quote, I thought I had control of my feelings of hate for Roxanne who rejected sex with me for a homeless man that smelled. He also testified that he knew he could hurt her, especially after hearing like sex sounds coming from her apartment, quote, I wanted to kill the bitch. Second, second, second degree murder. He said that he told Roxanne to stay away from him, especially when she was taunting him in the mornings when her lovers left. Well, deputy prosecutor Susan Wan said that Eugene deliberately murdered Roxanne because she refused to have sex with him. Deputy public defender David Hayakawa said Eugene committed manslaughter based on extreme emotional distress and lost control in a tragic occurrence of events in which Roxanne seduced him and then played with his mind. Get the, get the fuck right out of here. Serious. This, this case is infuriating. Infuriating. Well, the jury did find Eugene guilty without even knowing about the two previous murders. On May 17th, 1997, Circuit Judge Wendell Huddy sentenced Eugene to a mandatory life term with parole. With parole? I couldn't believe my eyes. With parole? <laughs> you serious, Clark? I got so mad about that that I like looked it up. Like, does Hawaii not have, you know, life sentences without the possibility of parole? Oh, they do. They have that. I, I don't know what the hell that you need to get that, but apparently like killing three women ain't it. Well, stay with me, stay with me, because Judge Huddy actually imposed a mandatory minimum of 20 years in the life term because there was a firearm used in the commission of the offense. And then each of the three firearm charges were 20 year minimums. And each of these were imposed to run consecutively, which means that you have to complete one term before you can start another. So there was 20, 40, 60, 80 years that had to be served before he would be eligible for parole. So, <sighs> <sighs> Finally, the judge told Eugene, quote, you must be removed from society and you should have been removed a long time ago. Exactly! Yes, exactly. Well, after sentencing, the now 65 year old Eugene Barrett was sent to federal prison in Oklahoma on the mainland. In 2003, he actually returned to Hawaii to continue his sentence at the Halawa Correctional Facility. In late 2003, Eugene fell ill and was transferred to the Palimomi Pali 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 Medical Center. On November 8th, 2003, Eugene Barrett died at the age of 72 after serving eight years of that sentence. Eugene was survived by most of his family and his son, Bert, whom he hadn't spoken to since he murdered her mother, Roberta. Bert's wife, Taya, stayed in contact with Eugene so that she could send him pictures of 
his grandchildren, and to trace Bert's genealogy. In an interview, Taya later said, quote, I have respect for the man, Eugene, because if not for him, I wouldn't have my husband and my children. Well, isn't that saintly? And that is the story of Eugene Barrett. <coughs> Okay, again, if you want to know any of the items that I used in today's video, then just make sure that you check down in the description box because everything that's available will still be linked. Also down there are some coupon codes. There's also a new coupon code for Koki Cosmetics. I love their stuff so much and they were so kind to give me a coupon code. This liquid eyeliner, best ever. Also, my favorite lip liners, Koki. You don't know about Koki, you're missing out. If you have a crew time story that you would like to recommend, make sure you check in the description box. There is a Google document, like a link where you can give me all of the juicy details. Okay, well, thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. A new coupon. Coupon. <laughs> Good eyeliner. Oh, come on. It's 20, 30, 40. Nope. Where's my primer? Ugh. Get it together. Get it together. Ugh. My teeth are gross. Bah. I need a teeth cleaning so bad. Wait, didn't it say it was held on bond? Castner. Castner. Man, I love this eyeshadow palette. <laughs> Goose is in there digging to China. Hey, Goose. He's not. Murray, what? <laughs> Annie. Why can't I say Annie? Annie. 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 Annie.